Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the new MetaQuest 3S. This is a fully self-contained virtual reality experience that can run all of its own software. It also can do mixed reality where you have virtual elements getting mixed in with the real world and it has an awesome pass-through feature where you can see everything around you. And this is the lower priced version of the MetaQuest 3 that I have right here that I looked at about a year ago. And I'll save you a lot of time here. If you're wondering what the real difference between these two are beyond price, it's image quality. The 3 has a much nicer display than the 3S, but it's not all that bad. And if you're looking to buy a bunch of these for a school or an institution or something, this is probably not a bad way to go because you will get more bang for your buck without much sacrifice. It has the same processor, it can do all of the same things, it's really just the display and the lenses that are a little different on this more affordable unit. And we're going to take a closer look at this and what it's all about in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that Meta sent me this particular headset free of charge. However, no other compensation was received. All of the opinions you're about to hear are my own, and they are not reviewing or approving this before it gets uploaded. And in the past, I've bought my own Meta headsets, including the three here that I reviewed last year, along with the two and the one. So I've got a lot of experience with these headsets as a more general user, and hopefully this will help you make a buying decision because I anticipate these things being pretty popular over the holiday season. So let's get into it now and see what this new VR headset is all about. Now the Quest 3S here with 128 gigabytes of storage costs $299. That is $200 less than what you'll pay for the same amount of storage with the regular 3 headset. So quite a difference there. It has, though, the same processor as the 3. So it's got a Snapdragon XR2 Gen 2. It has the same amount of RAM at 8 gigabytes. It even has the same controllers here. They're all interchangeable. The controllers run on AA batteries. They do have a rechargeable battery kit that you can get for it. I use mine with just rechargeable AA's, and they last quite a long time here. The controllers are very comfortable. I really like the changes they made with the Quest 3 controllers. And there's also a number of titles now that allow you to just use your hands without the controller at all. And the headset here can track your hand movement in real time, which is pretty cool. So all in a very similar package here. In fact, the accessories for the Quest 3 will work on the 3S. So for example, on my Quest 3, I bought it with their Elite strap here. I can take this off and snap it right onto the 3S. So all of the accessories out there should fit this exactly. In fact, both headsets weigh about the same and feel about the same uh, when I am wearing them. It's amazing how many similarities they baked into these things. This will support 72, 90, and 120 hertz refresh rates just like the regular Quest does. So again, not much of a difference there. But as I mentioned, the big difference here really has to do with the display. So inside of this thing, you have a lower resolution display that is very similar to how the Quest 2 display looked. It has an 1823 by 1920 resolution per eye. And on the more expensive 3 headset, it runs at 2064 by 2208. Now those are just numbers, but I can tell you in looking through this headset after spending a year <laughs> inside of this one, uh, the display quality is very noticeable. The 3 here just looks a lot better given the higher quality optics, but also because of the higher resolution display. It is noticeable, very much so, but it doesn't mean that this display is bad. It's just feeling like the Quest 2 display did. And if you've never played with VR before and you really don't want to spend all that much money on a headset, you're going to be just fine with this lower resolution display because the experience of using the headset is exactly the same. And this has Fresnel lenses in it. They, uh, again, work just fine, but this one has a higher quality pancake lens, as you can see here. The other big difference is that their uh, IPD adjustment on this is locked into three positions. So what you do here is just move the lenses uh, this way. They snap into one of three positions here. The IPD range is 58 millimeters to 68 millimeters. And IPD stands for interpupatory distance, which in other words is the distance between the pupils in both of your eyes. So if things don't look quite aligned, you can adjust the IPD setting here to get it to work a little better. 
Most people will fall within the limits here, but there are exceptions which happen from time to time. And if it just doesn't work with you, you're never going to get, unfortunately, into a position where it does. Now on the three, they have an adjustable dial here that gives you a lot more of a fine-tuned control over the distance between the lenses here. And this will also go a little bit further on the IPD to 71 millimeters versus 68. So if you anticipate some weirdness in your eyes, the other headset might be the better way to go. Now, if you are a prescription glasses user, they give you a spacer here that you put in between the, uh, the current face mask and the headset. So you pull this out, you put this spacer in between, and that gives you a little bit more room for your eyeglasses. Now, I wear progressive lenses, and I have more of a correction on the nearsighted side of things than the farsighted. And what I found with my own experience is that I do fine without the glasses. In fact, I see very clearly inside of these headsets, which I don't do in real life when I'm looking at something close in. So I would try just using it without your glasses first to see how you do, and then if you decide you need to put the spacer in, go ahead and do that. Meta also now offers these screw-in prescription lenses that you can get, which would probably be the best way to go if you want to correct your vision and still have a good experience here. One other big difference here on the display side is that the field of view on the 3S is a little narrower than what you'll get on the 3. So inside of the 3S here, the field of view is 96 degrees horizontal and 90 degrees vertical. On the regular 3, it is 110 degrees horizontal and 96 vertical. So more of your peripheral vision is covered in the Quest 3 versus the 3S. But I found that when you're intensely involved in a VR experience, you tend to forget about it. But it is a noticeably slightly more narrow field of view on the lower priced headset versus the more expensive one here. So really, again, the big difference here is the image quality. And if you find yourself as an enthusiast, I think you'll want to go with the more expensive version. But if you're more casual and just getting into VR for the first time, this is still an excellent experience, even with a lower resolution display. Now here on the left-hand side, you've got a USB Type-C port. This, of course, is where you charge the headset. Meta says you'll get about two and a half hours on a charge with this. I agree with that assessment. It's pretty close in my experience. The battery life will vary based on what you're doing with the headset. Some games are more demanding than others, so uh, the battery life will vary a bit but it generally is around the two hour range. For me, my eyes are usually tired before I even hit the end of the battery life, but you can get uh, additional straps for this that actually have batteries built in to extend the battery life. You can also connect this directly to your PC using this port, and they recently came up with a new feature that allows you to capture video directly from the headset using a USB-C to HDMI adapter. So many uses here for that USB-C port. Your power switch is over here. There are cameras all over this thing for the mixed reality experience that I'll talk about in a second. There is, though, no headphone jack on this new headset. There is one on the other Quest, so you will have to use the built-in speakers here or attach some kind of USB-C audio device. I'm pretty sure it supports that. On the bottom, you've got a volume rocker, and then this button here is a pass-through button, so if you wanted to take a look at the outside world while you're in a VR title. You can push this button, it pauses everything, and you can look around and see what is going on. The strap here that it comes with is fairly comfortable. I do prefer the Elite strap that you can buy as an add-on item, but I was able to find a very comfortable fit here. It is pretty easy to adjust. Uh, you just move these two pieces apart or closer together and then adjust the Velcro here at the top. I have two kids with different size heads and they're constantly swapping the headset back and forth and for that purpose I think the Elite strap might be a little bit easier to work with. Now the setup process on the headset here is super easy. You're dropped into mixed reality first where when you first put it on you'll see your room as the headset sees it and everything is where it should be. It doesn't feel off-putting at all just that you're at a lower resolution than your own eyes might be seeing things at but it feels very natural. And from there, you can get everything set up. During a live stream a little while ago, I ran an app called 
first encounters, which is a fun little example of what mixed reality can be. And the headset will automatically map out the space that you're in. It even detects furniture and windows and walls and integrates that into the gameplay. So it's a really fun way to get started if you can find that first encounters game. It's free and a great way to get a feel for what mixed reality is all about. And then, of course, you can hop into the App Store and pick up a bunch of other titles to play with. In my experience with this, the performance on the 3S feels identical to me as the 3. I ran a bunch of games that I own on the Quest platform, and everything felt pretty much the same, just at a slightly lower resolution than what I was experiencing with the regular 3 headset. Note that there's not all that many titles that are 3 exclusive, so a lot of the Quest 2 and Quest 1 games will also be available there, and those really don't have much of a penalty on the 3S because they were all targeted at the lower resolution of the Quest 1 and 2. So I think you're going to have a great time exploring the library of games that are available. The games are a little more expensive perhaps than mobile games are. They're a little less than what you might pay on a Nintendo Switch, uh, but do expect to uh, shell out some bucks for some of the games that you might encounter on there. There are plenty of demos to play with too, so I would grab as many demos as you can. And I found in some cases that the demos are enough for me uh, to have some fun with a particular game before moving on to something else. So you can spend a lot of time in here without having to spend all that much money initially. Now for PC games, the performance of the 3S is identical to the 3. However, the image quality on the 3 is much better than the 3S for PC gaming. That's because PC games have much more robust graphics. They benefit from the higher resolution display of the 3, provided your PC is powerful enough for those graphics. And of course, you've got better optics on the 3 to take in those details more so than you can on the 3S here. There's a lot of different ways to connect these headsets to your PC, both on the hardware and software side. You can plug in directly via USB-C. I like to use Wi-Fi though. I use AirLink and Steam Link for my PC gaming. Many people like to use an app called Virtual Desktop to do that as well. So there's a lot of different ways to make that connection. I would suggest connecting your gaming PC to Ethernet so that it has a nice dedicated connection to your network and then put an access point for wireless in the room with your headset. AC Wi-Fi I found works fine. I have this now running on a Wi-Fi 6 access point and it's pretty seamless from my perspective using this wirelessly and it's a great PC experience. But again, I would go with the 3 if you're serious about PC gaming just because the image quality is better. But this does run at up to 120 hertz. 90 hertz is doable on this as well so you do get the high frame rates that PC VR requires. And you can also use this as a virtual PC display where you can put a big, huge display in front of you or have multiple displays around you. It's all pretty cool stuff, but again, the higher resolution of the regular 3 headset might do better for that kind of work. So overall, I found this to be a very fun and affordable entry point into virtual reality and mixed reality. It's really nice to see that from a performance perspective, there is no compromise here. So titles that are made for the more advanced 3 headset will also run on this one. Maybe next year we'll see a bigger gap between the higher end model and the lower end one. But right now, this performs exactly the same, just with a lower resolution display. If you are a serious VR user and you've got a Quest 1 or Quest 2, You'll probably want to get the Quest 3 with the upgraded display, but for everyone else, this is more than adequate. You're going to have a blast with this thing, and there's a lot of fun titles in the Meta App Store at this point. They've had a number of years now to develop a pretty good library, and you will definitely find a lot of fun stuff to play with with this virtual reality headset. For a lot of the games, you do need to have some space to move around, but there are many others that can work seated. So be sure when you're in the App Store just to see what they recommend if you are physically constrained uh, in space. There's also some fun multiplayer applications like Space Pirate Arena that can turn a larger space into a laser tag thing. It's really cool. So there's all sorts of fun stuff with these devices. I might explore this in a future video. I don't get a lot of traffic on this VR stuff, sadly. I don't think there's as much consumer interest for this 
as there should be, but if you do want to try it out, this is a great way to introduce yourself to virtual and mixed reality. That's going to do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching.